Hello, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Mohan Krishnan. I'm the CTO at BBM. Today, I want to share with you guys a story about how we migrated the BBM users, and this is the, what was originally known as the BlackBerry Messenger, from our ca uh, Canadian data center on-prem to Google Cloud. Before starting, though, I'd like to ask maybe you guys a couple of questions. Firstly, how many of you all are considering doing a migration from on-prem to the cloud in maybe the next six to nine months? Show of hands. OK, great. So hopefully this content is relevant for you all. The next question, how many of you all know what BBM is? OK, keep your hands up. How many of you all know that BBM is today available on Android and iOS and continuously being improved? Great. So you guys know the, our story. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Let's go. Uh, so let's start. What I'd like to start with is a bit of background, because I get lots of questions as to what's going on with VBM, what's happening. So this is just to set things up a bit. Uh, I work for a company called Mtech. Mtech is Indonesia's largest media conglomerate. We own TV stations, both paid and free-to-air national TV stations. Uh, we own production houses and been in the media business for about five to 10 years. In about the last two to three years, we've also been going online, primarily, uh, again, taking our content from traditional media to online. So we run today Indonesia's largest online uh, news portals, similar like Condi Nest, but for the internet. Um, we also run Indonesia's second largest video platform. We only second to YouTube. Today, our content and our services touch over 50 to 60 million monthly active users in Indonesia. As part of that strategy of growing that side of the business, we decided that besides just being a content producer, we also wanted to be a platform, a platform for people to come and consume our content. To that goal, we found that in Indonesia, there's still a large amount of BBM users compared to the rest of the world. And we then engaged with BlackBerry to wholly license. So we've acquired a license from BlackBerry for BBM for the consumer business. So today, since 2016, when the agreement was signed, we build, develop, and distribute BBM for the consumer market. A key part of achieving our goals around that was migrating BBM. And I'm going to get into the specifics around that in a bit. But I'd like to share how large, from a human standpoint, this project was. It spanned about two years. Uh, we officially only finished in June 2018. It involved anywhere between 40 to 60 engineers, spanned across 12-hour time zones across three different countries, Canada, Singapore, and Jakarta. The next thing I want to share with you guys before we get into the specifics is that this is not your father's BBM anymore. Many people still think that BBM is only available on BBOS and BB10 devices. This is BBM for Android and iOS, modern operating systems. Apart from that, this is also a BBM that is on par with your modern Facebook messengers and WhatsApp. Uh, this includes things like video and voice calling, large groups, availability on multiple platforms, including desktop. And more importantly, what we've been focused on and why we made this transition is we're building features for our market. How many of you all are familiar with WeChat? So OK, WeChat, you guys know that story. It's huge in China. And the reason why it's huge also is because it's a messenger that's focused for that market. That's exactly what we're doing. We're trying to make BBM the WeChat of Indonesia. To that goal, we've been building features like wallets. So today, if you use BBM in Indonesia, you can send money to each other. You can make transactions. You can buy things like internet top-ups or your phone, uh, pay your phone bills. Apart from that, we've also been integrating BBM into the local phone systems. Uh, in the next two months, we'll be rolling out a feature where you can make PSTN calls and receive calls via a number that is assigned to your BBM. So when you register for BBM in Indonesia, you get a local phone number, and you can use it. This is extremely relevant for the market that we operate, where there's still many users who are in rural areas with very poor data connectivity. They can still keep in touch by piggybacking on the PSTN network to contact their friends and family on BBM. So in a nutshell, 
what was the transition? So it involved moving the BBM infrastructure footprint from Canada all the way to GCP in the Asian region. It also, so why, and why did we do this? Well, first and foremost, as you guys probably know, BBM as a globe, the global user base for BBM has reduced, but it's still a sizable user base in Asia, primarily in Indonesia, uh, in Africa, and in the Middle East. We wanted to bring the BBM services closer to where our users are. This will improve latency, it will also improve network reliability. That was the first goal. But a second major driving goal was re-platforming BBM on cloud infrastructure that allow us to build the type of features that I was talking about earlier in a fast and effective manner. That was a huge goal. Lastly, it's important to keep in mind that during the entire one and a half years that we were doing this transition, we still had billions of messengers and tens of millions of users using the platform without any problem. We were migrating them in the background without them realizing and not impacting their service. Also, during these 18 months, we continued to push out new and exciting features for our user base. So what was it that we migrated? I know there are some ex-Blackberry people in the, the, the audience today, so these guys are probably familiar with it. But BBM was not a simple, uh, simple application to migrate. It consisted of over 20 major components. Each of these components had multiple subcomponents. You look at it and you go, and you might go, wow, it looks like a microservices architecture. From our end, I think it was an accidental microservice architecture. It was an amalgamation of different components built over a 10 to 3 year timeline from different teams using different technologies and frameworks that are available at that point. That added a lot of complexity. Uh, we had everything from JBoss, different versions of Spring, custom Java frameworks that we had to rationalize and plan how we were going to deploy and run in GCP. Apart from that, it was a sizable infrastructure footprint. Over 14,000 VMs on physical machines running in BlackBerry's data centers in Canada, NetApp appliances, uh, Fusion IO, uh, fiber-based uh, uh, storage, a, a large data analytics and Hadoop clusters, and also an assortment of databases. It had a 600, we had to uh, migrate a 600-node Cassandra cluster, multiple MySQL, and Postgres databases as well. So it was a large, a large piece of infrastructure to move. This diagram here is mostly for shock factor. Don't, don't look at it too hard. But this is an attempt at trying to map out all the different components that made up BBM and their interconnection. As you can see, the summary is it wasn't a simple system, neatly compartmentalized into logical components. That it was not. So how did we do the migration? What did it involve? There were three major parts or tasks that we had to go through. Firstly was the preparation, and I'll talk about that in a bit. Secondly, we mapped out the different services that were running and how they would end up running in GCP. And lastly was the actual traffic cutover. And I'll go through that one by one. What we were trying to answer in preparation was what is there to move and where do we move it to? Why, the reason why we had this question of what is there to move was keep in mind that the team that was going to do this migration, for the most part, did not build and did not operate this service. They didn't have any idea as to what was running. So we had to go through a process of trying to inventory the service and understand what was there first. From an inventory standpoint, there were two major aspects. Firstly, was just mapping out the individual services. Where is the source code for the service? How do you build it? What are the Jenkins pipelines? What are the dependencies? What are the configurations that we need to pu pull in? Each component had anywhere between four to 500 different configurations. Many a times there were configurations where people didn't understand. It's just been that way for multiple years. And we had to do a lot of so-called archaeology to try to figure out and put the pieces together. The second part of the inventory was from an operation standpoint. 
how did these services run in their current on-prem infrastructure? What were the type of servers that were required to run these services? What were the type of metrics and alerting that was used to make sure that these services were healthy? What type of log output did they produce? Which parts of the log were relevant from an operational standpoint? And lastly, even bandwidth utilization, because we were moving to a model where egress bandwidth was going to be metered as opposed to a typical on-prem setup where you, don't, you, don't, you buy the bulk top peak bandwidth throughput that you need. So we had to map that out and figure it out. What worked really well for us from a service standpoint of trying to figure out how the service ran is that we documented everything in code. We didn't just write it all down. We actually had our developers work out, write Ansible playbooks to get these all set up. And they made sure that the services at least stood up within a vagrant box. That gave us the assuredness that this information was documented. From an operation standpoint, what we did was we created this giant spreadsheets, as you can see here. Again, don't look at it too hard. But essentially, it mapped out all different aspects of the service and how it ran in production. The next step was actually deciding where we were going to go. It wasn't a slam dunk that we were moving to GCP. We actually ran POCs with three different cloud vendors. I'm sure Tim and some of the guys from Google in the crowd still remember this. We ran two to four week POCs on site with BlackBerry, where we try, where what we did was we tried to put one, two key services into the cloud and then actually load test it in there, see how it worked. This gave us two things. Firstly, it helped us further understand these individual services because we were also still figuring it out. And secondly, it gave us a lot more clarity as to how these services were running within, GC, uh, within the individual cloud providers. In the end, we did an evaluation. We evaluated on three major crit criteria. The technical capabilities of the cloud provider, its partner support, and costs. It goes without saying, I'm here at Next, and GCP was the winner. And, we ha and we've been happy with the decision. Uh, since, you know, we've been happy with the decision. It's really worked out for us. From a partner standpoint as well, we worked with some really great partners like Pythian and Cloud Cover who are also in the room here today, and that really, really got us over the line. The table on the right here shows some, like in a condensed form, the different aspects of the comparison. There were a lot more details. I can get into specifics if you guys want, but it was a long process. By the time we were done with this phase, inventing the system and picking the cloud vendor, we were four months into this project already. So now that we know what we want to migrate, we know where we're going to migrate to. The next step was to really figure out how are we going to have these components run in the cloud. And the first question, and I've seen this question you know, being repeated through conversations that I've had with other people who have gone through migration, and I'm sure some of you guys who are considering migration now are having this exact, is have, are having this exact question, is do we just lift and shift the services as is? Or do we use this as an opportunity to re-engineer it, re-platform it on something new? Now, intuitively, lifting and shifting makes sense. You minimize risk. You're already making this major change. Why change the application at the same time? Why increase the complexity? But the challenge with uh, services that were originally built for on-prem infrastructure, I believe, is that sometimes there are certain aspects or certain operational aspects of those services that rely on very specific on-prem characteristics. Trying to replicate these on-prem characteristics in the cloud, cloud end up adding risk to your project. So I don't think it's a done deal. I don't think anybody who's making a large migration, a complex enough migration, is ever going to have purely a lift and shift or a re-platform, re-engineer. It's going to be a spectrum, a hybrid approach. And for us, that's exactly what happened. There were certain characteristics of components that when we saw, we realized that we'd have to re-engineer. The first being applications that relied on file storage. So these were applications that wrote to disk, and you know, either the sand disks or NetApps. We realized early on that there was a great opportunity to move this to cloud storage, which was more suited for object storage. Now, making this change was a lot of work. 
It involves a lot of change. We practically rewrote these components. However, what we realized in rewriting them is a lot of existing complexity within these applications, for example, to handle sharding between multiple file endpoints or to handle failures that only happen within file systems, we could remove. And it actually greatly simplified these applications. Yes, we had to introduce special code to handle the fact that now your writes uh, have much higher latency because they're going over HTTP. But in the end, we felt the trade-off made sense. The other two areas where re-engineering made complete sense and was a no-brainer was on our logging side of components and data engineering. I'll go into that specifics in a bit. So if you look at all those different components, you know, I said there were like you know, almost 20 different components and multiple subcomponents. What I'm, trying to, what I'm going to try to do today for you is di you know, digest it all and talk about these different components or subcomponents within these different levels. So networking applies for all the components that we're talking about. Let's start. On a networking side, on-prem, what we were running were a lot of F5 load balancers. Uh, how many of you all have F5 load balancers in your data centers today? OK. As you guys probably know, those things are great workhorses. They're extremely reliable. They're extremely flexible. You're not going to have that same level of flexibility in the cloud. And it was, that was one of the gaps that we had to deal with early on. Uh, within our on-prem data center, the F5 LTMs were used for both external and internal load balancing. Uh, they were also used for NAT. So how did we migrate this existing functionality to GCP? We essentially ended up using every type of load balancer that's available in GCP. We used the network load balancer, the TCP proxy load balancer, HTTP load balancers, and the internal load balancer. And I'll go through why we ended up needing to use every single load balancer in a bit. The other aspect was NAT. There was no immediate NAT solution available. Managed NAT is still not available within GCP today. At least I don't think it is. Or, or maybe it's just coming out. Two years ago when we started, it was not available yet. So we ended up deploying our own uh, uh, NAT solution. We ensured it's HA. The good thing today is if you Google, you'll find uh, several best practice references on how to set something like this up. This is a solved problem. But you have to roll, at least we had to roll our own back then. And back then, we weren't entirely sure how to make sure that it was HA. So we had to figure that out. Other gotchas that stuck out when we were doing the networking piece. The first was multicast. Again, if you're on prem you don't have, and run a physical uh, networking, you know, you're not going to have problems with having multicast. Multicast is not available on any cloud provider. And we had components that relied on multicast. In particular, some of our Java applications use this grid caching technology called InfiniSpan. The good news there is changing InfiniSpan from using multicast to using other type of drivers. We ended up using TCP ping. It's pretty straightforward. So we had to make that change. The other thing to be aware of, especially if you have a large footprint, is that there's a maximum cap on the total amount of IPs that you can have within a network. And this catches uh, big deployments off. When we were doing this, we had a maximum of 7,000 IPs. And this led to a lot of sleepless nights as we were trying to work things out. The good news is, by the time we actually went to production, Google upgraded its network. And now, today, they support up to 15,000 IPs. And our 6,000-odd infrastructure footprint fit within it. The other gotcha was around load balancers. And this is why we ended up having multiple load balancers. The first gotcha was we had a service that was serving an endpoint publicly on port 5061. The TCP load balancer supports a specific list of ports. There are about 12 ports that it support. If you don't happen to, if you have existing clients or services that rely on these ports, without changing it, you're dead in the water. You cannot serve from it. So that's why we had to replace it with a network load balancer, which didn't have this limitation. So now we have NLB. Secondly, we had services with TLS endpoints where the clients were doing mutual TLS. So we couldn't rely, again, on HTTPS load balancers where TLS was being terminated on the load balancer. We ended up solving this by using TCP load balancers and doing mutual TLS on the instance itself. 
Then we had a class of uh, applications where there were bog standard HTTP, uh, HTTPS endpoints, and we could serve them through the HTTP load balancers. So these are some of the limitations. And again, you know, you, you look at what's out here, you look at Kubernetes and all this cool standard stuff, but we don't have that luxury when you're moving existing infrastructure. And finding these type of problems early and designing for it is critical. On the storage side, the story was a bit more simpler. The good news, the, the summary or the upshot was, for the most part, whether it uh, the performance of uh, Google's GCS and PDSSD disks uh, surpassed what we were having running in our data center. We had NetApp appliances, and we had SAN arrays built off S SSDs. And both PDSSD and GCS was a good fit and replacement for what was running there. Now we get into the database and caching side of things. The first database that we had to deal with were around, we had a large Oracle deployment. Now, as some of you all might know, if you've dug into this, Oracle is not you know, sanctioned to run on GCP. Neither did we want to pay any Larry Allison tax. We think his yachts are large enough. So not only did we have to plan to migrate the database, we had to plan to transform the database of Oracle to Postgres before actually rolling it out or migrating it to GCP. So we planned that in and got that done. The when it came to some of those MySQL databases, we just targeted Cloud SQL as Cloud SQL was reasonably mature by that point, and not many of these databases were super critical for production running of our app. For Cassandra, a lot of time was spent trying to size the instances that were going to run the Cassandra nodes. So figuring out from a you know, CPU, RAM, we ended up using PDSSD. Turned out those were fast enough for our use case. We also spent a lot of time working out the operational aspects of it, building playbooks, understanding how we were going to do rolling updates, dealing with down nodes. All that had to be set up, and we set up a special team within our group to handle that. They got most of this set up within two to three months, but that was a big investment. Redis and Memcache, we started out setting these up on our own, doing something similar to Cassandra. But then we found a partner, Avon. And they are pretty competent. I would strongly recommend them if you're looking at trying to set up something similar. At that point, Memory Store wasn't available. We hope going forward we can look at Memory Store uh, as a replacement for our third-party services uh, from Avon. Net, net, we end up with uh, about 400 uh, nodes of Cassandra nodes, a host of MySQL, Postgres, and Memcache instances. The next portion was monitoring. And this is where it got interesting. What we had originally on on-prem was a large CA Wiley uh, deployment capturing hundreds or thousands of JMX metrics from each instance. All of this was then graphed on Grafana, and alerting was done through Nagios. Now, when we first looked at that, our natural inclination was, you know what? Let's move all of this to Stackdriver. That makes sense. It's provided in Google Cloud. Why wouldn't we leverage it? Turns out there was a big mismatch, at least at that point two years ago, with getting JMX metrics, especially the vast amount of JMX metrics that our services were using, into Stackdriver. It was non-trivial. We would end up needing to write lots of scripts, manually listing out the JMX metrics. It wouldn't scale. The second aspect that we found uh, Stackdriver suffered with was just around the sheer size of our dashboarding. The Stackdriver dashboards back then, I haven't looked at it lately, so you know, don't get upset with me, but they just weren't going to cut it. They were underperforming. They frequently just got they hung. The amount of analytics that you could do on it was very poor. So we ended up going with Datadog, and that's worked out quite well for us. So what we have today is a setup that looks similar to this. Uh, we export. There are certain metrics that don't come from the instance, like GLB metrics, you know, metrics from your managed services, from your networking, from your software-defined networking. Those we export from Stackdriver to Datadog. Apart from that, we run the Datadog agent uh, on our instances, and that also pushes metrics to Datadog. Datadog then functions as a system to collect our metrics, as well for us to build, uh, handle alerting on it. These then become available as dashboards, which our 
ops team and our developers use, as well as for incident management through Ops Genie. It worked out quite well for the most part. Today, we have over 6,000 hosts running in this manner and over 250,000 metrics running on Datadog. So it's quite scalable. There are a couple of gotchas worth considering. Firstly, is there was a lag between capturing the stack driver metrics to Datadog. Now, I don't know if they were just trying to throw a spanner into that integration. Just kidding. But um, it was delayed. And initially, it was unusable. There was a six-minute delay between something happening on the load balances and it being available to Datadog. We worked with Google and Datadog to get that solved. Today, the delay is about a minute or less. But there's still a delay, and we continue to work with them on it. If you guys are looking at a similar integration, do push them along. It'll benefit all of us. The other thing worth considering is that Datadog is not available within the GCP infrastructure. At least when we rolled it out, it was hosted on AWS, which meant that you're going to have a fair bit of egress going out of from your nodes, especially if you have a large enough footprint like ours, going to Datadog data centers, which I think now are AWS in Europe and in US East. However, the good news there is the latencies introduced by that wasn't too damaging. For the most part, the dashboards and the alerting and the metrics are all being captured in a reasonable amount of time, and it's working OK for us. The next aspect was around logging. Okay, and what we had running on-prem was we'd have instances running a Kafka client that also doubled up as a syslog agent. So applications would just log as though they're logging to syslog, it would then get picked up by a Kafka client, which would then push it to a Kafka broker. And the Kafka broker then had a bunch of workers picking off the logs and writing it to a Hadoop file system. This mostly worked, but what it meant is that to query these logs, users would need to spin up Hadoop jobs and basically do a map reduce to find logs. This was, not, this was a bit slow and painful. So we wanted to re-engineer it. We didn't want to just have this coming along. Secondly, also, especially if you're re-platforming on GCP, there are tons of built services like Cloud Pubs Up and Dataflow that make sense to solve this problem. And that's what we ended up with. So what we ended up with is we ran the standard FluentD agent on the instances. This FluentD agent acts as a local rsyslog daemon. So again, you can have those applications as though, you know, just log as though they're writing to syslog. It then gets pushed to Cloud PubSub, which then gets picked up by Dataflow. And then Dataflow writes to two endpoints. It writes to Elasticsearch, uh, and is accessible to our team through Kibana. And it also writes Avro files to GCS, and is accessible to our teams from Zeppelin. The use cases for Elasticsearch and um, our Zeppelin Kibana is different. Elasticsearch allows our users, um, especially our operational team or the developers working on the services, to access these logs pretty quickly and easily through some search queries. But we can't, we try to, from, for, from a cost standpoint, we try to keep our Elasticsearch cluster maintained at a fixed size. We don't want it to continuously grow. So what that means is that we age out logs. So we keep up, up to about 14 days retention within our Elasticsearch clusters. But within GCS, we store those logs now for perpetuity. But what it means is that to access data from that, it's a bit more tedious. And you go through, uh, we provide Zeppelin as a front end for it. And it mostly works. It also serves as the input for a lot of our data analytics and data engineering jobs, which is what I'll talk about now. So on a big data standpoint, as I mentioned earlier, we had raw data in Hadoop FS. We had a on-prem, we had a large Hive-based data warehouse. Uh, we were managing these data engineering jobs using Uzi and ClickView for dashboarding. This entire stack was re-platformed. We replaced Uzi with Airflow for job management. Uh, we replaced all our Hive data with uh, Spark, so, and which would feed off GCS, so the logs that we had ingested earlier. We also had event streaming coming in through GCS, and this would be picked up by uh, ETL jobs running on Apache Spark. This Apache Spark cluster would also write back to GCS where necessary. And for, for our data science and data engineering work, we would use Parquet files. We would also sometimes, for, primarily for business analysts and for business reporting, 
run ETL jobs and write it straight to BigQuery. And then we'd have Tableau run queries against our BigQuery instance. So this allowed us to, in some cases, have, you know, when you have clear business reports that are clearly defined and not going to change too much, we have ETL jobs write to BigQuery and make them queryable extremely quickly. In cases where we want to provide more ad hoc analytics, we provided that through Zeppelin running over our Parquet files within GCS. This as well has worked quite well for us. We migrated over 100 ETL jobs uh, that today run over 18,000 vCPUs. We process 20 terabytes of data a day. And these jobs, on average, run between one to two hours max. In the past, when we were running on-prem, these jobs would take sometimes up to two days. So this has been a huge improvement for the business. And finally, at the top of the stack is our application service. And for this, when we looked at what was running, initially we saw a combination of over 15 different type of CPU, RAM, disk combinations. We tried initially trying to streamline this, migrating what we had. But what we found in the end is that, at least for our use cases, the comp the configurations that were running on-prem were not the configurations that we ended up running in the cloud. In retrospect, it seems obvious. Because we tried to auto-scale some of these instances, what we could end up with was we generally ended up reducing the size, the footprint of these individual instances so that we could scale them up and down easily. So my suggestion here, or the takeaway here would be don't waste too much time trying to do this, especially if you're coming from an on-prem environment. Just get to the point that you can test this and figure it out as you go along. How you do that is what I'm going to touch on a bit later. So we've just finished the whirlwind you know, plan of trying to figure out how we're going to re-engineer, what we're going to re-engineer, how we're going to run that. That now, again, took us about two months plus sitting in you know, windowless meeting rooms, working together with partners like Pythian and CloudCover and our engineering team, and getting all that bashed out, testing some of the assumptions. But now that we had figured it out, the next step was to actually build the service up. Now that we know what we want to go, how do we get running? The first thing that we did before actually coming up with a plan was, and this was actually done quite early in uh, our transition plan, is that we started with some guiding principles as to how we were going to do traffic cut over. And again, I think this is a takeaway for teams. You need to sit with your business and figure out what is acceptable to them. From our end, because we are a real-time messaging system with tens of millions of users, it was decided that we cannot afford to have any downtime for our users. I put an asterisk there, and I'll come back to it in a bit. But we didn't want to have any downtime for our users. We couldn't afford that. What that meant, though, is that from a planning standpoint, from a timeline standpoint, we buffered things. We stretched things out. We ensured that we had enough time to do the engineering, which is why it took two years in the end. There is definitely going to be a trade-off in terms of how much downtime you, can, you are willing to take and how much time the overall transition is going to take. That you need to figure out yourself, but do consider this. The second thing that we knew from the get-go is that we wanted to allow for learning through the transition process, through the traffic cutover process. Because, as I mentioned earlier, for the most part, this was a team that did not build or operate this service before. We knew that there were lots of unknowns, unknowns. And the only way to figure these unknowns was to actually experience it when we were running in production. How did we achieve that? We achieved that by ensuring that the traffic cutover could be done in an incremental fashion. And I'll touch on how we achieved that in a bit. The last thing is we wanted to be resilient to mistakes. We wanted to make sure that if we had a problem in the traffic cutover, we didn't have to incur downtime until the problem was fixed. We needed a way that we could send traffic back to our on-prem DC and then ensure that services could continue to run while we figured out how to actually fix it in Google Cloud. So that meant no big banks. We couldn't afford that. The traffic cutover itself can be broken down to four stages. Firstly, we're setting up joint networking. Secondly, is getting the data replicated, the app server deployment, and the client traffic cutover itself. Let's go through this. One thing that's really nice about Google Cloud that we leveraged was the ability to set up a dedicated interconnect between our on-prem DC and the data centers in Asia. Now, 
because Google has a private interconnect, they talk about it, they, they, it's called their premium network. This ensured that we could set up these networks between these DCs, and they were low latency and highly reliable. We didn't have any outage, any service impacting outage during the period. Every now and then, we'd have some spikes, but they were mostly resolved. But most importantly, the latency between our data centers in Asia back to Canada was between 200 and 250 milliseconds. This meant that we could do certain type of traffic cutover strategies that not having this type of uh, latency would afford. So for example, if the latencies were a lot higher, some of the database replication techniques wouldn't work. And I'll touch on that a bit. So because a large footprint of our data was stored in Cassandra, that got us replication for free. Cassandra, as some of you guys probably know, has native replication built into it. So that was pretty straightforward. We spun up our Cassandra nodes, let the replication run through, and we had our data in GCP. When it came to Postgres, we set up master-slave replications. Alvero is here. He worked with us on it. Um, and what we had to do in the end to actually get the users onto the new master was to actually do a master promotion. Now, this is the one time that we had to take some downtime. When we made the master promotion, we then have the application service, uh, service point to the new master and proxy requests back from the old application service. So there was a minimal downtime of about five to 10 minutes while this process was ongoing. This didn't impact any of our key services, though. Messages continued to work. People could chat with each other, and therefore was seen as acceptable. When it came to caches, we modified our application to be able to do dual writes. So any application that would use memcache or Redis, we introduced the ability to define more than one cluster. It would write to both clusters, one cluster operating in GCP, the other on-prem. And then when we finally cut over, we would both read and write from the next cluster. So we've got the data migrated. So we have the networking set up. We've got the data migrated. The next step was actually rolling out the app servers. Now, if you remember from the start, I mentioned there were many, many app servers, many, many services. So the first step was to really map out all the dependencies with the application servers and pick one application server with the least amount of dependencies. We then would take the deployment of that application server till the end. What I mean by till the end is we would have production traffic working on that one application server, that one service, before moving to the next. This is almost like canarying your traffic cutover. It allowed us to ensure that any type of mistakes that we might have made with our first service, we do not repeat for subsequent services that we were cutting over. And I think this was, a bit, this was uh, very useful for us. If there were any requests that, so when we moved the service over to GCP, if there were any requests that were dependent on services that weren't in GCP yet, because we're cutting one service at a time, again, we would be able to leverage the, our GCP direct interconnect to just proxy these requests back to our on-prem data center. If we didn't have that low latency link, a lot of this type of migration techniques wouldn't be possible. Once we had this single individual's app server running in GCP, we would then cut server to server traffic to it first. And again, that also would be cut incrementally. We'd have 10% of the fleet make the requests and then slowly bump it up more as we had more assurance that the service was running fine. We then would repeat, we then move to the clients, we would then, we then move to the client traffic cutover. How did we do this incrementally? The first step required instrumenting the client to be able to receive service endpoints from a third party. So basically push the service endpoints to it. The way we achieved this was obviously we had to push out an, a new version of a client that supported this capability. But we also leveraged Firebase remote config as the backend service to push these values or the service endpoints to the client. We could have built our own end service to do this, but the benefit of using Firebase remote config was that it already has internal capabilities around client targeting that, would have be, that proved to be very useful. And it also allows you to roll values or key updates incrementally. So we could say 1% of the entire client population has this new service endpoint. See how the service performs, and then slowly ramp this up. When we got to 100%, we then move to the next service. So essentially, that's what it was. We did service by service, piece by piece. We take the learnings, and then apply it to the next one. 
You, you, you repeat it 20 times, and you fully cut over without your users knowing. And that's it. That's how we migrated the entire BBM service to GCP. I think there are a couple of key learnings that we discovered as we went along. Firstly is there are definitely going to be gotchas. Unless you're deploying a cloud-native service that was already designed for the cloud, there are gotchas hiding somewhere. And you need to dig them out. If you haven't found them yet, it's probably because you haven't looked hard enough. Get alignment from the business in terms of what impact they're willing to take as part of the transition. This will really define how much effort and time and money you're going to need to invest into your transition. The third aspect is, and this is something that we totally missed when we were starting out, is the communications between the different teams involved in the transition is going to be your single toughest non-technical problem. We were not prepared for this. This communication can be between any group. It could be between your partners, yourself, and, G and Google Cloud technical team. Or in our case, for example, it was that, and also the combinatorial impact of having teams spread across Canada, Singapore, and Jakarta. You multiply of this, and you've got a very n-square problem on your hand. Lastly, I'd say, and this really worked well for us, is bake in the ability to fail. You're going to be making mistakes. That's the only way you're going to get something complex right. We'd, if you bake it in from the start, you can recover, learn, and move on. Thank you very much.